Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Oof. Okay. There's a few housekeeping things just before we start. If everyone can please turn off their cell phones, they do interfere with the uh, microphones um, all over the place. Um, and also during the Q&A, if you wouldn't mind going to the microphones to ask your questions so that we can have the audio for our recordings. And um, number three, if you would like... If you're not on the Star Forum email list and you'd like to be, please do sign up at the front there um, before you leave this evening. Um, good evening and welcome to this discussion. Uh, the Death of the News, it's co-sponsored. This is a Star Forum um, uh, discussion and it's co-sponsored by MIT Center for International Studies and Technology Review. And welcome to our speakers here this evening. Maria Belinska, who's the editor of World Current Affairs at the BBC and currently at Harvard University as the Ruth Kahn Nash Neiman Fellow. She's also the author of The Bagel, The Surprising History of a Modest Bread. Maria's uh, radio documentaries have certainly sustained me over the years when the BBC World Service was my only link in isolated, usually war-torn places to the outside world. Susan Glasser is, is the executive editor of Foreign Policy and the key innovator behind its relaunch as a daily online newspaper. Prior to joining Foreign Policy, Susan worked at the Washington Post as the assistant managing editor of National News and previously, whilst with the Post, reported from Afghanistan and Iraq and ran the Moscow Bureau with her husband, Peter Baker. Jason Ponton is the editor-in-chief of the award-winning magazine Technology Review and TechnologyReview.com, published by MIT. Previously, he was the editor of Red Herring, editor-in-chief of the Acumen Journal, and he wrote a regular column for the Sunday New York Times about new ideas and technology. He's also written for The Economist, the FT, Wired, and is a frequent guest on ABC News, CNN, and NPR. Welcome to you all, and um, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. This genuinely is going to be uh, a conversation. From 5.30 to about 6.30, we're going to chat amongst ourselves without any formal presentations, but I strongly urge you to interrupt and heckle and ask any questions you have. And then for the last half hour from 6.30 to 7, we'll have a more formal question and answer period. If you have statements, which I'm sure many of you will have, because this is an opinion upon which everyone has an opinion, why don't you reserve them for the last half hour and we'll ask you questions as well. So. Um, the title is The Death of the News, and I hope we can show you that the question mark um, is, um, is unnecessary, that the news is not dying, that we're simply shifting to a, from an industrial period of news manufacture. But it is behoven upon me to go and give the gloomy part at the beginning to set, to set everything up. And it's, in fact, not in any way difficult. During the first quarter, of uh, last year, advertising revenues at newspapers declined on average 30% in the first quarter. And then they declined an additional 10% in every quarter subsequently. And in the last six months of last year, magazine, newspaper subscriptions fell by 10%. The number of ad pages in consumer magazines shrunk by 26% in the last quarter of the year. And while magazine circulations aren't dropping quite as quickly, it's becoming more and more expensive to maintain their rate bases. And with fewer and fewer advertisers willing to reach those declining rate bases, magazine publishing is becoming a less and less rational investment. And the consequence of this is that everywhere, newspapers and magazines are going broke. Sun-Times Media, the owner of 58 newspapers, including the Chicago Sun-Times, declared bankruptcy, bankruptcy at the end of March 2009. 
the Star Tribune Holdings Corporation, the Journal Register Company, the Philadelphia Newspapers LLC are all similarly bankrupt. The Seattle Post Intelligencer now exists only on the web. The Rocky Mountain News, Colorado's oldest newspaper, is gone. And the business magazine portfolio, upon which Condé Nast lavished more than $100 million in investment, is gone. PC Magazine, gone. Domino, gone. Country Home, gone. It's a dolorous and long toll. So, something happened. And we're going to explore what, and perhaps suggest some ways which uh, we can revive the craft of dramas in the future. Before I begin, I want each one of my panelists to answer the question that Jay Rosen, who is a professor of journalism at NYU, says all journalists must now answer before they have any right to talk, which is, who are you and where are you coming from? <laughs> so if Susan to my left will explain how she got into the business of new media journalism and what was her circuitous route there? Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me and to all of you for, for coming to this conversation. Uh, we journalists these days are a fairly self-obsessed bunch and happy to talk uh, until you know, you're know you completely bored uh, about the future of the news business. So I hope it's not too much of an insider conversation, but I think it's an important one. And, uh, you know, first of all, I guess what I would say is to take a little bit of issue with the with the title uh, of the panel. Uh, I think in many ways it's, it's a little bit disingenuous because I suspect that we actually have three optimists here rather than three pessimists, or at least what passes for optimists, uh, you know, at a moment of clearly tumultuous change and, and upheaval in the news business as it transforms uh, from from what you rightfully called a sort of industrial era model of production. Uh, and that means that a lot of people are, you know, sort of losing their moorings. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, I f think of myself uh, and I think I'm just at the exact wrong age to experience this glorious transformation <laughs> of the news business because I'm just old enough uh, to be a fuddy-duddy and to have spent already a long time uh, in a print world that uh, I think remains hostile, angry, and even contemptuous of uh, the internet as a medium. Arguably, you know, traditional print journalists have been at war very unsuccessfully for the last 10 years uh, with a medium, you know, uh, and blaming in a way the, the instrument of our transformation rather than, than embracing it. And uh, certainly I hold no claim to innovation to any technology expertise uh, you know I'm I'm not even the person you know in my small family of three that you would go to uh, to figure out why the wireless isn't working so you know I'm not a new media person by you know disposition or training or anything like that um, the flip side is I have become in some you know interesting way I think you know for me uh, a total convert to the idea that uh, you know, this is a transformation that, you know, heralds potentially an enormous golden age for uh, people who care about information, people who care about uh, the news, people who care about transparency and uh, knowledge, people who care about going to places in the world that you couldn't get to uh, in the past except with enormous difficulty, um, intellectually or actually. Uh, and so, um, you know, my view is that there's going to be winners as well as losers in this um, transformative moment for journalism. And, um, you know, as long as there are people who are interested in bearing witness, interested in speaking truth to power, interested in accountability, then there will be journalism. And, um, you know, I'm certainly uh, not so old that I can't let go of a piece of paper as my preferred means for communicating that, that information. Um, but. I think I'll stop there because I'm interested to, to hear what everybody else has to say. Well, I'm, um, I like the fact, Susan, that you use the word um, wireless because um, I, it, it sort of brings me to, you know, I'm, I'm not primarily um, on the net. I'm uh, in radio, but these days I say I'm in audio journalism. Mm -hmm. And of course, wireless at one point meant the radio. That's and right. I think it's, I think there's an advantage to uh, having worked in radio because uh, although I, I'm happy to say the sort of uh, 
the great um, blow that radio was dealt by television was before my time, um, I've still had to, I, I've, what I've had to grapple with is thinking about audiences in many different ways. And I've already, so even before getting to the whole question of um, uh, how do we think about expanding our, um, our audiences and using this new technology that has been given to us, we were already trying to think, well, my goodness, at the BBC, there are five um, terrestrial networks, domestic, and the World Service, and um, where I sit, we've been making a specialist foreign affairs programming for each of those networks and sometimes having to compete um, both internally and externally for airtime, mm -hmm. uh, so that we're sort of, we, I think we've been really aware of the need to think about our audiences in different ways, which I think is a great advantage when we start to come to be in this period of great churn um, and where I, I feel that it's, um, I, 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 you know, I don't think any of us really can predict what's going to be happening. Um, there's so much that is that is changing, but one thing I'm very uh, I'm convinced of, and and I think this is where we're all um, optimists, and I agree with what Susan just said that I I'm convinced that there is a, a hunger for um, uh, understanding the world around us, and um, whether that be in Britain, where I've been dealing mostly with British audiences, although as you may hear from my accent, which is sort of strangely lost in the middle of the, of the Atlantic, I'm actually American, and I've lived in Britain for 25 years. Um, but I've, I've had the opportunity to put to people in, for example, just to say something from where I'm from, one of the most interesting um, uh, experiences I had was being on the launch of a new radio network, Radio 5 Live, which was 24-hour news and sport, aimed at a middle sort of what we in Britain would call sort of like middle brow audience um, um, outside of London, uh, uh, not necessarily university educated. And uh, my task was to start a new program about Europe. Now Europe in Britain is not exactly something that people are going to run to turn their radio sets on for. I mean, it's, it's, almost, it's, it's almost the opposite. And yet what we managed to do was to try to think about the coverage in a different way. And, and the best moment of that uh, one of the best moments of that experience was getting sort of letters from listeners saying, I never thought I'd be interested in this. Um, and and I'm, I'm convinced that, that there are also wells of people here who have not necessarily, who are interested and haven't yet been served. Yeah. Okay, but before we, before we get into the optimism, <laughs> right, <Yeah. laughs> something clearly yeah. happened, mm -hmm. really dramatic. Mm -hmm. So 30 years ago, there were in Europe usually four or five national papers in most countries, a, a few national um, radio stations or television stations. In the states, large city papers, sometimes two for the major cities, and a couple of national papers. And these organs were trusted, admired, respected, and most of all, hugely profitable. <laughs> and on their profits, they bankrolled less profitable activities, the, the Iraq Bureau. So something broke, something changed, and um, uh, Susan, maybe you could begin. What, what changed so dramatically? Well, it, you know, you, you've written, I think, very, very smartly about this yourself. Classified advertising went away, and it's not coming back, and that was the real, you know, sort of driving force behind that monopoly power in, for those big city newspapers, and it was just a tremendously, uh, you know, profitable cash cow, uh, and, you know, we journalists were very insulated, you know, from the business of, of, of our craft and probably had very little clue of just how dependent uh, those newspapers were and they grew fatter and fatter and fatter, uh, you know, at least on the Sundays and it was uh, really something that didn't inherently go together with the journalism, which is of course what we've seen now, uh, you know, classifieds really have not commingled again on the web uh, in the way we would hope, uh, although there are, you know, specialist job boards that, you know, can still target communities of interest. And so, you know, that, that economic powerhouse went away for those big city American newspapers. Um, and the wastefulness of the industrial era, you know, it was like a factory to work even at a great newspaper like, you know, the Washington Post was much more comparable with, uh, you know, what you might think of as sort of 1970s era uh, 
you know, factory producing anything else in the U.S. Uh, than, than we like to, to think of. You know, we were not necessarily 21st century knowledge workers, uh, you know, sitting there in our sort of networked pods, um, although we had some of the tools of those knowledge workers. Um, the, the great sort of daily newspaper was much more tethered to the, you know, means of production uh, than we all realized. And, and I think it's really even only in the last few years um, as uh, the tide of uh, flesh money has receded that people have come to terms with that. And I still think that's early days. You referred to this transformation earlier in the past tense. I don't think that's true. I think that we're uh, at the, you know, still at the beginning of a, a long-term transformation of, you know, information, journalism, uh, how we write and think about the world, and that that is, uh, you know, the content is still very much print content or, you know, audio or television content being adapted to the new medium, uh, and I think that the content is going to start to change uh, more significantly uh, over the next few years. What broke? Well, um, I mean, you've, you, again, you've, you, you've, well, you've written about it eloquently. Susan has talked about um, the, um, the, the newspaper model in the United States. I mean, I, I have not worked in American newspapers. And um, of course, the British situation is a little bit diff different in that people still do consume quite a few newspapers. And there are quite a few um, national newspapers. But it's, it is a different market. It's a more homogeneous market. It's a smaller market. Um, it has a different tradition. Uh, obviously, I think alongside the, the um, the, the classified advertising going, you, you, you had this extraordinary technological revolution which gave the, the, the users the ability to choose when and what they wanted. And um, I, I wanted just to throw out something sort of a bit provocative um, um, to ask also whether, you know, sometimes we need to turn, I've been to many um, uh, discussions uh, here in Cambridge about Oh, woe is me, the end of journalism, and so forth. And um, I, I think we journalists need to be sometimes a little self-critical, too, um, and to, to ask, you know, to what extent were we engaging with our uh, publics as much as we, as much as we uh, should have been? And uh, you know, one thing that's really struck me, uh, being outside the United States for um, over 20 years, um, and having been, as I, I've, I've, I've been involved in the launch of many new programs and the relaunch of many new programs, I've seen uh, newspapers in the UK be revamped, redesigned, um, is how conservative with a small c, not, and, and I don't mean political, I mean just not wanting to change, a lot of the mainstream media here strikes me. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, so could we have engaged our publics more in the past? I think probably we'd all agree that that's the case, would that have um, made a difference? I don't know. Um, and uh, I think, though, what I think is exciting is that change doesn't necessarily mean dumbing down. And I think that's really crucial. I think the thing that's really challenging is we don't know. Actually, we say, oh, the, what the, sometimes there's been an equation. The public wants you know, something that's going to be, I don't know, just about Tiger Woods and, and so forth. Well, actually, I, I don't believe that. But we don't have the metrics to know exactly what the public wants. And that's the big challenge, I think, now. And maybe technology will help in that regard. Um, but uh, that's, you know, I, I, think, I think it's going to be more challenging and interesting for us journalists to engage with that public mm -hmm. than sometimes is, is yeah. assumed. I, I think that's a really important point. Um, and I'm you know, sure you have something to add no, on that, I, too. But you know, I, I think that this false equation of you know, sort of the internet means dumbing down. Um, in particular, you think about international news. Uh, you know, that has become a new and I think very sort of false and damaging piece of conventional wisdom that's that's left open the opportunity for you know people like uh, my website to to come into it because uh, you know I think these sort of more mainstream you know news organizations you know decided that there was no traffic in uh, international news or that people weren't interested in the world in the U.S. Well, guess what? That turns out to be, of course, as, as you know, sort of simplistic as it, as it sounds, as reductionist as it sounds. Um, and in fact, never has it been easier to collect an audience of actually millions of people 
uh, potentially who are interested in at a very sophisticated level uh, and you don't really have to pay any money to reach them or find them unlike in the past as a publication. Uh, you don't have any real distribution costs to get you know, to them what they want. I mean, you know, not all facing of the audience uh, is bad. It's also true that if you really want a big general interest site, you know, and traffic is your only barometer of success, how big of an audience, I mean, you know, there's a reason that Huffington Post, like, has all those, you know, celebrity slideshows, and, uh, you know, when it comes to the end of the month, you know, you should look at all websites and you will see a lot of photo slideshows of, you know, girls gone wild on spring break kind of thing because people do click through those <laughs> and it uh, increases the traffic. But, um, you know, we've certainly seen that, you know, it's possible to do a high-end, edited, curated site where what we consider the best articles in our print magazine or on our website often are the ones that get the most traffic. You know, that, you know, it's, it's just, it's a much more um, nuanced story than, than people have been led to believe. It's worthwhile saying that for all those who predict the death of news, the New York Times dot com receives around 14 million uh, daily, forgive me, um, daily uniques during the day, and on Sundays sometimes receives as many as 40 million uniques. And the most emailed stories in the New York Times tend to be the most dramatic uh, science stories, the ones that make people go, ooh, ah, and that you would never believe would be uh, highly distributed. So before we talk some other issues, I, I think it's important the audience know just how dramatic and thoroughgoing the technological shift that broke news was. Um, audiences online were, treated, were trained to think that news was entirely free. And though it might be the case that we can move niche magazines like my own um, or Susan's to a, kind of a, a semi-paid model online, news, which is a declining value to time, mm -hmm. has shown to be completely immune to a pay model, with a couple of exceptions. And at the very time that our circulation models online were bust, something incredibly dramatic happened in advertising. There used to be an old joke in advertising, right, that the advertiser would say, I'm wasting half my money in advertising. The problem is I just don't know which half I'm <laughs> wasting. So, right. but online, suddenly every advertiser knew exactly which dollar he was, he was wasting because he had a completely efficient mode of advertising, which was keyword advertising. And that destroyed the basic business model um, <coughs> of newspapers. So newspapers found themselves evaporating in revenues from both sides, and we're still living in this world where we're trying to make sense of that, that shift. So both ladies talked interestingly about audiences. And the big thing to me about audiences I find fascinating is that they aren't really audiences anymore in a totally passive sense. Mm -hmm. And I would really like to talk about this. So you guys all saw during Mumbai um, how the news was created by the people watching the terrorist attack uh, on the Taj Mahal Palace. We saw how when the plane touched down in the middle of the Hudson, Twitter was the first place to, to talk about it. And of course, most dramatically, during the events uh, in Iran over the last year, we've continuously seen audiences participating in the creation of news. So Maria, tell me how you think about the audiences <coughs> which you deal with now. Well, I mean, I would like my audiences to be, uh, I have not yet to find the right way of getting uh, it, my audiences involved in the creation of some of our uh, programming. I think that, um, I mean, I, most of what we do is um, half hour uh, audio feature um, documentaries. So um, I have, I have very early on actually, I was hoping that I might be able to use the internet to talk with people to get tip-offs at the very least. That was the sort of the first stage to get tip-offs on stories that would be interesting because our brief um, um, on these particular, with most of these programs is precisely to complement the daily news. I mean, my sense is that, you know, we, we, uh, we have um, one of our Neiman Fellows is um, Jeff Howe from Wired Magazine who um, coined the term uh, crowdsourcing. And crowdsourcing is a very interesting uh, concept and I think one which um, is quite appealing but would have to also be treated with a little bit of, um, well, for, for me, I, I think there's a, there's, there are hybrid models that need to be thought of in, in, in today's journalism. And I think that the, the, the thing is that I think that one can at the same time be working with audiences 
who are um, witnessing events and can send in information and indeed can do bits of reporting if they're interested. But I think that to, I actually think that group is pretty small that has the time and the money to do it. And to be honest, they're also a pretty small group socioeconomically as well at the moment. Um, but but at this, the, the, the ideal is you have those people, you have those people who are witnesses and you have the editorial sort of craft. And I do think one of the things is that we journalists haven't necessarily always stood up and defended uh, what we do as requiring some skill. Now, okay, maybe it's, it's not rocket science skill. It doesn't require a PhD, but it actually to do fact checking, to, do, to know where to look for context, to tell a story well. To tell a story well is actually quite, is quite difficult. And I think we'd all agree that a good novelist, they're not getting, don't, they don't walk the streets everywhere. So it's a, it's a few steps down from that. But a good story is something that is going to engage um, our, our, our audience. And we can, and what I really am looking for is a kind of partnership model with, mm -hmm. with right. audiences. And so, how, so that the, the audiences are informing the editorial process, they're giving us material, we're back in touch with them, and we sort of continue on this cycle. Yeah. No, I mean, those are great points. You know, I, two, two thoughts to add to it. One, uh, you know, probably citizen journalists are not going to be the future of uh, writing the technology review yes. for you. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, yeah. part of this is, I think, reflects the overheated rhetoric. You know, the early adapters to the blogosphere, you know, really had a very proprietary way of looking at, you know, their, you know, great wisdom and agility in being yeah. early adapters. but. Um, you know, they also have conflated, uh, you know, the medium and the, and the output to a certain extent. And um, I think that, you know, anyone who's just a, a consumer of media here, as we all are, should be beware uh, when you hear slogans, you know, proclaimed like, you know, you're all a journalist now mm. and that sort of thing. You know, everybody has always been a potential news source, right? No matter what the medium is, uh, you know, you could walk down the street a uh, hundred years ago and you know, see a building fall down and it be the source of news and information, uh, whether it was conveyed by telegraph or newspaper or TV or radio. And so uh, you know, this facilitates at Twitter, uh, if you're walking down the street in Tehran and you, know, you, you see some goons beat people up and you take a video on your cell phone and it goes on YouTube, yes, you're a citizen journalist, but that's just a technology empowering an action of you as a witness to news uh, that you would have uh, taken place at any moment in history. So I, I find that this, you know, again, suffers from, you know, the death of a clever label. Uh, you know, yeah. that's something to be aware of, you know, first of all. And second of all, though, and more interestingly from the point of view of where does news and journalism go from here, um, there are new opportunities to engage communities of interest and expertise in the production of uh, journalism and analysis. And I think that's a little bit of what uh, has happened as we've uh, started to play around with reinventing foreignpolicy.com. I imagine you have those opportunities with the technology review as well. I think that, you know, clearly our contributors uh, are also our readers. Uh, and, you know, we've seen as we sort of built something for them, you know, they've come to us. Uh, and uh, we relaunched our website a year ago. And, uh, you know, virtually all of those people who are now actively pitching us things and writing for us, and we're so thrilled to have them, you know, many of them came to this as readers. The, these were people who are interested in the world, who are academics, who are um, business people with a global orientation, who are uh, journalists, you know, living around the world. and. Um, they're our target audience as well as our contributors. So that's, that's a new thing. And then looking down the road, how is technology going to help facilitate and enable even more of that? I'm very interested in you know, this next stage of the web where we carry our social networks around as we experience content and, and talk about it. And I think for us, you know, that would be a whole new level of breakthrough because you know, first of all, uh, you know, Facebook and things like it are increasingly for professional networks and you know communities of interest as well as purely personal uh, and it's it's true that that sort of anonymous world of commenting I think is sort of you know maybe it's not going to die but I think it's pretty quickly going to be supplanted by the much more satisfying world of experiencing the news experiencing 
content, magazine articles, uh, in the context of people whose opinion you um, care about and are interested in. And the more you network, mm -hmm. the more interesting content will come to you. Uh, and we already see this with young people who are, you know, really seriously, not only in Silicon Valley, you know, say to me all the time, oh, I, I only read stuff that people, that comes to me. I don't mm -hmm. go searching for it. And these are really well-informed people. These are, you know, people who somehow have always read that really cool New Yorker article and read that New York Times piece. And but they, they, they the tell me networks. they don't go to the yeah. homepage of the New York Times to get that. Or even, I don't even think they look at their RSS feeds. They look at mm -hmm. Facebook. They look at their email. Mm -hmm. They trust the social networks to provide the news. Exactly. But this, this insurrectionary emotion that swept through citizen journalists and what is sometimes called we media, that was part of a broader trend that has kind of accompanied the, the death of news, which has been a, a failure in trust as us as journalists, yeah. that we are objective sources of information. Um, rather was so, thought just to be another more or less corrupt elite defending its interests, usually aligned with one party or another. Um, in many parts of the world, people think that the media is aligned with the, the media elite, the liberal elite. So when's this collapse of trust in journalists as a, a source of objective, mm -hmm. objective news? Why don't people like us anymore? <laughs> Well, did they yeah. so yeah. much before? I mean, that's, yeah, but, that's one interesting yeah. question. Yeah. Um, we, we're not quite sure how to measure that. Yeah, that's well, we, the thing. We know that so some part of the only it, two groups no disliked more are <laughs> lawyers and politicians. So, <laughs> even doctors are enjoyed more. So, what, at the very least, even if we can say that there is a large degree of skepticism, mm -hmm. that the news as it's presented in any publication is an objective account of what occurred. So where did that come from and how can we fix that? Mm -hmm. Restore trust in journalists? Yeah. Um, well, one th I mean, I think one thing that, that is interesting to keep in mind is that this sort of ob objective standard of, of journalists, this supposed golden age, is a relatively short period of time and, and yeah. actually has really come into its own, at the, I suppose, in the 20th century. Um, and you could argue that some actually really took off after the Second World War to some extent in, in the United States. But of course, in, in Europe, um, you still have uh, journalists, tend to, newspapers tend to have uh, political um, affiliation, um, which doesn't necessarily, by the way, make them more popular, I have to say, <laughs> among uh, in the public. But what I have found, found really striking is that if you look at the history of the United States, you had, um, you had partisan journalism um, at the beginning of the Republic, something, you know, Thomas Jefferson very uh, famously talked about, you know, he would defend, he would rather have sort of free, uh, what was it, uh, journalism, journalists than politics, I, I can't remember, journalists than government, or so anyway. Yeah. The, but, but the point was, he wasn't, obviously, he was, he was thinking about a kind of journalism that was a political pamphlet, was political pamphlets much more. And people were very engaged in the democratic process then. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have an an so answer to why, how one makes um, journalists more popular. I do think, though, that maybe, maybe some, there's something in the whole notion of community. Because one of the things, again, I'm sort of reading, talking with people um, here about where, where is journalism going to go now, that has uh, been mentioned a number of times is, well, obviously, we're thinking about where can we create value? Because, OK, the news, as we know, we, is free. We can get it from Google. It comes to us through our friends and so forth. So where is it that, what, what, what does journalism do that is, is valuable? And there are a number of different things we can discuss. Uh, but one thing that is community, and if you think of the, the the history of the small town paper, that was very much a community uh, 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 institution. And I think then people, journalists, I'm sure, in those places were respected and, and trusted. And I wonder if this, if that is a, a creating, um, uh, whether they be platforms or places, you know, places where information is sort of revolving around which are linked to communities is going to be the way for journalists to re-enter, sort of become white, go through a, 
um, I don't know, a whitewash of some sort or, 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 or have their popularity increase. And just, just a little footnote there, which I think is quite interesting, is that the one press that isn't uh, uh, in such bad uh, condition in this country is the ethnic press. Mm. And uh, uh, now, obviously, you know, this has a lot to do with maybe people, people coming to this country not speaking English well enough to read uh, um, their local their local paper in English. However, some of these publications are also actually in English. Also, apparently, New York City has never had so many um, ethnic language publications, um, and. Um, I think that there's something there about, there's not only an interesting uh, discussion to be had about transnational mm -hmm. themes that affect us all today, but also the community mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. adherence to the community. Look, there's, there's clearly a crisis of authority. It has, it has many sources. You know, part of it is also you know, journalism's own claims for its, its yeah. not only indispensability, but authoritativeness. Um, you know, a sense of we know there's more behind the curtain. Uh, and so you know, why do you speak in this omniscient voice that you know, pretends to be the be all and end all? I think it's part of the shift from the sort of scarcity economy, which is what um, you know, print journalism uh, was before, whether in newspaper or magazine, it was all about you know, sort of saying, no, here's what we can put in this discrete physical you know, object and present that to you. And we present it as a full package, even though we ourselves know that there's not, right? The untold story, that was always what was fascinating to people uh, in this sort of pre-internet age. Now it's it's a wholly different kind of editing. It's about you know helping you navigate through you know endless streams of information and writing and video and audio and helping you understand and make it digestible again. I believe that there's still a very important role for editing, but of this new kind uh, that will come out of all of this you know increasing. But it's a, just a totally different model. It's not about saying no. We're only going to tell you those things which we think are important. Um, that's not happening anymore. If you really want to click into all the source material, uh, if you have a, you know, newspapers that are committed to putting in the underlying links to everything, you can do that. Uh, you know, it's very hard if the, you know, the source you talk to the reporter, uh, they don't like how the story came out, they're going to blog about it, they're going to talk to another reporter, they're going to, it's all available for you now in a way that just even a few years ago, that wasn't the case. And so, you know, these claims of omniscience, these, you know, for lack of a better word, information arbitrage, you know, becomes a lot harder to do. You know, I was a correspondent uh, for the Washington Post in Moscow just a few years ago or Afghanistan. And, you know, if you don't have any other rival sources of information about what was going on that day in Russia, you know, it's a lot easier for me just to sort of tell you whatever I want to say and leave everything else out. Um, and can I just add something because I, uh, you know I agree with what you're saying, and I also think that the the, the establishment of an agenda. Yeah. I mean, we you know we, of course I think there um, this is not to 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 Im sort of um, imply that 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 there was a, a bias at particular institutions, but by the mere fact that you decide as an editor what is on your agenda, you've only this much space you are going to be making choices which are going to leave certain things out and got actually quite a few things out. Um, and that, and, and I think uh, at a time when also in the United States there was a sense of a growing sort of discontent with uh, a certain view of, uh, of Washington, yeah. uh, that, just, that just fed into all of that. Um, and it's so interesting to see this alongside the, par the, the parallel of how um, from 1964 and the defeat of Barry Goldwater, mm -hmm. how um, the conservatives were thinking, well, you know, we're not, we're, our voice isn't being heard. We're going to be, we're going to, we're, they, you know, looking at other, uh, at, 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 at outlets which they could use and come, and then finally the, the talk radio phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But as that happened, um, alternative news sources were created that effectively catered to people who That's did right. want to hear different, yeah. mm -hmm. different voices. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to talk a bit about how the media has contributed to the polarization of the culture. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are political and civic consequences to the fact that people can now do what is some called, sometimes called ego casting, that they can tune in only to the, yeah. the media that they wish Absolutely. to go and listen to. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, is this occurring? Yeah. And no, clear, clearly yeah. this is occurring. I mean, you know, we all have our own anecdotal evidence to support it, but we know it's occurring. And, you know, um, I say this as someone whose, you know, sister's homepage is the Huffington Post. You know? <laughs> and uh, what does that mean? And, you know, one, traditional journalistic organizations, the New York Times, other newspapers, they still exist and they're still providing a lot of the underlying content, uh, even if it's then being spun, you know, by right, by left, by libertarian, by this. So, you know, one big question posed by this panel is what happens if that goes away in a very significant way? Uh, you know, those organizations so far are not evolving to become what you would call sort of good journalistic citizens or, you know, they're not coming in to support that um, original reporting in the way that would compensate for the death of those news organizations. So I, I do think that's where I join the alarmist, you know, group. I'm, I'm, I'm broadly speaking definitely in, in the optimist camp. but supporting who's going to be supporting that original underlying journalism, which I think is right now still providing the core of content for both the mainstream sites and the left-wing sites and the, the conservative sites. So, you know, right now that doesn't bother me as much, but you could see a situation pretty quickly where that could become, you know, sort of a huge crisis uh, if the underlying, you know, original news gathering goes away. I, I'm a big believer that it doesn't have to, that, you know, the the web is uniquely suited to what potentially, if, if things line up the right way, is a golden age of reporting in an in-depth way on critical institutions and, and uh, aspects of our society. I mean, I, I think that future is still possible. Uh, but, you know, there's no question, you know, that we are also those of us who are navigating this world are profiting to a certain extent uh, by those remaining institutions that are paying the bill uh, for the people still doing the, the reporting. Um, and that's certainly the case in what I'm doing, you know, and uh, that's, I like to tell people that's the good news and the bad news about journalism. The good news is there's a better, cheaper model. The bad news is it's so much cheaper. That anyone uh, can do it. You know, yeah. that anyone can do it. and. Uh, you know, the entire content budget for, you know, for a very good website, you know, might cost only uh, what it costs to support two or three reporters for the New York Times. Is the polarization well, of the news bad? Well, I mean, I, I, it, it, it worries me because it worries me that there isn't dialogue. Um, and I think for a healthy democracy, one needs dialogue. Um, and. Uh, that the that for all for all the sort of mainstream media faults after post World War II, the fact is that what it did do was it it most of the country would sort of consume similar stories would be exposed to even maybe if they weren't expecting it um, uh, uh, um, for for example foreign affairs um, uh, I remember watching Walter Cronkite when I was a little girl so mm -hmm. um, and and now it is very it, it is easy to stay within a the framework that where one feels comfortable one is not going to be unless one is looking for it it's it's hard to sort of exit one's comfort zone and I'm I'm one has to make an effort and and I find it quite interesting. Um, working for the BBC as an American coming in, having done a number of debates in this country, which we've then broadcast, that we've put at the table people who, from different um, viewpoints, who've then said to me, gosh, you know, I really enjoyed that because I usually don't meet this other person uh, 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 in, the, in, in an American forum. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I, I, I don't have an answer to this. I wonder if this is just simply as with, um, you know, as, as we saw sort of radio being affected by television and it was fragmented, so now there's a fragmentation which you, you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Um, and, and how therefore, so that the interesting challenge is to, you know, have, have a sort of body of knowledge and of information that, that, that a good number of people in the society can be consuming so that it informs also their their democratic decisions, their their voting decisions, their what, whatever it may be, their participation in civic life, um, and you know the thing that is it worrying on top of the polarization. I, mean, I was talking to somebody who's doing some research about this today. Um, is also 
the 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 growth of um, sort of um, s simulation or simulated life, as it were, and mm -hmm. and and younger people and and the ability one has now to escape actually reality altogether. It's much easier, mm -hmm. um, and so if the reality is is bothersome, well, one can just go into second life, for example, or one can do a game. I mean, and I don't wish to necessarily overstate it. I don't know enough about this, but it is. It is something that you know it also has an impact on social ties. Yeah. I mean, I have to say though, I, and I, 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 I'm both in the position of agreeing with this and also th thinking that this is another area in which our journalism conversation has become very chicken littleish. I mean, you know, on the one hand, that's all true. On the other hand, if you just look at the extraordinary growth and the 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 power of. Uh, these new tools that we have at our disposal to connect people with stories, with other places in the world, uh, with world events. You know, college students can, you know, not only give money to Haiti uh, in reasonable amounts, but, you know, interact with it and volunteer and do all these things, and they are, you know. And so maybe they're not reading, you know, 15 sort of conventional 40-inch news stories about what's happening in Haiti, but I bet they know a lot more than their equivalent peers would have known 20 years ago about the things that interest them, uh, you know, first of all. Second of all, I think the golden age, now that we have some metrics, was probably very overstated. I think people didn't read those stories. I think the actual audience for a certain category of, like, important but dull, capital I, capital, you know, D, stories in the New York Times or the Washington Post was probably extraordinarily low, even if they were on the front page, and that we were not as audience facing as we wanted to recognize. And if you look at the, the internal numbers now of how those stories do on the web, you know, nobody reads them. Uh, and so I suspect that that was probably true in print as well. So therefore, this myth that we had that, well, they were subscribing to the, you know, New York Times at Columbia 30 years ago means that the kids were reading this stuff. You know, they were probably reading the sports page, mm -hmm. right? Or <laughs> doing the crossword. Yeah. But can, can I, I mean, I'm, I'm really interested because I, I want, again, I do, I, uh, but looking at those polarized, uh, this polarized uh, discussion to, that is going on between, let's say, MSNBC and, and Fox, I am quite interested to know to what extent there is a public out there um, that is, that wants, that actually wants dialogue, that wants to hear dialogue. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, again, I just feel that the anecdotal evidence I have is that they do. But the common wisdom at the moment is not necessarily going that way because obviously, you know, you, you look at any um, report on whose numbers are up, it's MSNBC and Fox, mm -hmm. and it's not CNN. Mm -hmm. not, not that CNN is necessarily promoting dialogue, but I mean, it, we, but we, I actually think that there are a lot of people out there who would want a sort of, um, whether it be, on, let's say, on health care, I mean, something where you would actually get into some of the nitty gritty, but from both sides, and it wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be just about scoring points. Yeah. It's, it's fairly dramatic to me that, while it's probably true that the, this golden age of journalism was a artifact of the, of, the, of the fact that these newspapers had to reach the largest possible audience as industrial vehicles mm -hmm. in their hometowns, and maybe were not that much read, there was a moment last summer where I felt that the, all the assumptions I had about news were, were breaking down. The most popular uh, television news in the country by any measure at the moment is, I'm sorry to tell you, Fox News. And the administration said that Fox News had so, so little resembled a con conventional news uh, gathering organization and was so much a tool of the Republican Party, they were no longer going to, tr going to treat it as simply another news organization. Um, Fox News was tremendously offended, um, and so were the, so were the, uh, the viewers of, of Fox, and it made no difference to the culture at all. Mm -hmm. um, after a short period of time, um, uh, the administration backed down, and Fox has continued to be increasingly popular. It was, a, it was a strange moment in the culture to me, because it showed that people really were satisfied with their, their traditional sources. I'd like to talk about um, news outside the United States. We've been very much focused on America. And that seems to me inappropriate for MIT Center for International Studies. So things are totally different elsewhere. Um, 
And perhaps you know, Susan could talk about this. In China, there's the dread hand of the state. Mm. India is a wonderful news environment. It's, it's an anarchic and sectarian uh, newspaper environment. Yeah. So tell us what it looks like outside the United States. Well, I think that's right. There's no one global story, but many different narratives, uh, you know, coming into play right now in very interesting ways. And ultimately, we may here in the U.S. be able to profit from understanding what works and what doesn't. Uh, in other cultures. Uh, first of all, print is by no means dead uh, all around the world. And there are places such as India uh, where newspapers are growing, uh, which actually, when you step back to think of it, makes intuitive sense, right? You know, you have a rising emergent middle class, education being a priority. Uh, and so, you know, they're, they're coming into a medium that we're busy, you know, sort of writing the obituary of, uh, which is an interesting sort of coexistence, right? Uh, and um, I think that's an important reminder that um, one size fits all generalizations, whether uh, you know here in the U.S. or globally, do not you know make a lot of sense uh, because the internet is again it's not one size fits all. It's empowering uh, you know different adaptations in different cultures, and in fact that's much more the story than the sort of universal hand of globalization perhaps that we might have thought it was. 10 years ago. But, um, you know, the Russian language internet uh, looks a lot different uh, than how it's evolved in the EU or in Britain and the United States, for example. Um, and I think that's important to remember. Um, you know, for I was just reading a very interesting piece on the way up here today about, um, about uh, sort of social media and blogs in Russia. You know, you have a situation where the Kremlin over the last decade has very strongly uh, acted to take back control and renationalize, in effect, the one mass medium that remains in Russia, which is television. Uh, but they basically sort of left alone what remained of print, uh, you know, very small circulation kind of elite intelligentsia newspapers and magazines. They don't really bother with them so much, but they have a very, very marginal effect on society. Uh, and they've also been very confused about what to do with the internet. Uh, but in Russia, the main internet uh, platform for blogs, Live Journal, combines blogs and social networking. This is a very interesting phenomenon. It's been very powerful on the one hand because of that. You know, an individual blogger arguably have had more influence more quickly than, say, here in the US over politics. But looking forward, that actually puts huge powers in the hands of the state, for example. And in Russia, that's something to be concerned about. You have a very authoritarian-minded uh, government in the Kremlin. And as they become more sophisticated, they realize that understanding on one platform both who the bloggers are who are in opposition trying to rally people to go uh, and protest outside the defense ministry, and also the list of contacts being in the same place, that's arguably a better tool for the authorities to crack down than it is a tool for uh, journalists and for uh, political dissidents. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I think that's an important thing to remember as we sit here in the US and have a very US, maybe Anglo slash uh, you know, US view of it. Um, and then the other thing to throw out there for you is I think another wrong assumption that we've all made in the early days of this is that, oh, English is the lingua franca of the internet. That means that you know a sort of new global culture is coming into being. Um, just because people can read in English doesn't mean that they want to. And I think that mm. these um, uh, the internet is developing language and culture specific uh, traditions of journalism and communication, which are actually going to be enabled even more by the next wave of technological development uh, as, you know, automatic translation and, you know, smart translation where sort of open source communities figure out how to translate things comes available. Um, I don't even know what that's going to do, but that's going to be a very important new stage in all, um, you know, anybody who's involved with, with journalism. Uh, that's going to happen and, and pretty soon. What does it look like outside the United States and England? Uh, well, in, uh, in England, um, as I said, I mean, I have actually, I brought some statistics here of, uh, I mean, newspapers. Are we, for example, the Murdoch loan Sun tabloid, I think, has a daily circulation of six million. You have, uh, but you, 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 the, the it's a tiny country as well. It's yeah. a tiny country. And, and then, of course, you have um, the Telegraph, I, just a minute, I have it here somewhere. Because it is quite interesting. No, actually, 7.8 million. The Daily Mail is another tabloid, 4.8 million. The Daily Mirror, another tabloid, 3.5 million. 
Daily Telegraph is a broadsheet, 1.8 million. Guardian's 1.2 million. And these, you know, basically 61% of 61% of British adults read a, a national newspaper. Um, having said which, there's there are. It's not like it's rosy completely. I mean, in fact, um, one of the Sunday papers, The Observer, <laughs> two weeks ago, I think, did a whole revamp again. Um, again, thinking, you know, this is the way we're going to keep to engage our, our readers. I, mean, I think Britain is inter well, Britain is very particular because it has the BBC. <laughs> and uh, if you look at the radio market, for example, uh, we, the BBC is more than 50% of radio listening. Um, television, it's less than that, but it's a, it's, it's a very strong presence. And I think it also has an effect on the other broadcasters. Uh, because there is such a tradition of going to the BBC for the authoritative news story. And so uh, the other um, television um, news programs t take that into account. And that ups, I mean, to, to some extent, I think that ups their game. I mean, maybe that's a little arrogant of me to say that, but I, I, I think it, I th I th I think it um, does. But, you know, have, again, interestingly, younger people are not turning always to the BBC. And, and this is something that the BBC is very exercised about um, and thinking, thinking a lot about. Um, it's, it's, for example, telling today we got news from London that there have been some massive cuts uh, to the BBC and its budget, and they've gotten rid of a few uh, radio stations, and they're going to cut down on the um, online presence um, by um, a quarter. Uh, most of that is non-news, but interestingly, they kept the channel, the digital television channel, that is aimed at young people. Um, even though every, I mean, it, it doesn't yet, it, it, it has an audience uh, that is not necessarily where the BBC would want it to be, but, you know, the BBC wants to make sure that it, it is um, thinking um, about the next generations. Um, I think it's it's also interesting to note vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. that you have um, uh, countries which are in technologically actually in many ways ahead of the U.S. Um, and are consuming their news um, on mobile technologies mm -hmm. more than we are. So I think um, in Colombia, I can't, I'm afraid, I, I think it's um, El Mundo, the, the main daily there, which has a print circulation of half a million. Well. I, I, I know it's a few million, and if, whether it's two or three, I can't remember, but who consume it on their mobile phones? Um, today, uh, one of my fellow uh, Neiman fellows um, was telling me how um, consumption of radio on mobile phones in Gaza huh. is increasing, and similarly in Egypt. Yeah. Um, and these are things that actually we're not doing as much here yet. So the, actually, I think the US, the U.S. can look to, you know, as you said, I mean, the U.S. can look to other countries for, for actually future solutions as well. Absolutely. Yeah. The truth is, is that the fretfulness about the death of news is a uniquely American perspective in some ways. The news is flourishing quite well in many other countries, and often because publishers and editors have been um, more willing to experiment with new technologies, more willing to work with their communities, and also because outside the United States, news is more valued, particularly in countries which have oppressive regimes or when news has, has more value. Mm -hmm. um, China is an interesting example. China is a tremendously vibrant mobile uh, news uh, population. People often um, uh, contribute and talk about this on anonymized um, handphones and websites as well, which is an interesting response to the uh, uh, internal repressive uh, technologies of the Chinese government. We have 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, to have a discussion with the audience. I'm going to conclude by asking them how to fix the state of news. <laughs> Before we get there, um, I'd love to hear your questions and hear, hear what you guys think. We have, we have microphones here. May I suggest that you say who you are, uh, and as it were, uh, just briefly where you're coming from, and then ask your question. <clears throat> my name is uh, John. I'm an engineering student here. Um, I guess my question is, in an online community that's dominated a lot of times by aggregators and blogs that 
not hijack, but definitely use the content generated by journalistic uh, journalists and and those sorts of organizations. How can a real journalistic organization uh, generate enough value to overcome that kind of lift that other people are taking off of them that outweighs the cost of generating that news? That's the big question. Yeah, that's <laughs> we haven't figured yeah, it out yeah. yet. We're, we're or, open to your ideas. <laughs> or to the contrary, um, since it costs a lot to generate news through the traditional form of journalism, how can an organization generate the same sort of credibility using a crowdsourcing or this better, cheaper model? Well, let's, let's talk yeah. about both this. Let's talk about aggregation first, and then we'll maybe talk about the authority of, of crowdsourced information. Um, so anyone want to talk about aggregation quickly? Well, I, I, it is. It's a big yeah. question because um, the aggregators are doing this um, with, with no payment or minimal payment. And I mean, obviously, R Rupert Murdoch's threatened to, to, to yeah. shut it down. But what does he really not want to be on uh, Yahoo and Google for to get traffic to his sites? See, I, I don't think, know. I mean, yeah. it's interesting. So Rupert's either, Rupert's either lying when he says that, or he doesn't actually understand where his traffic comes <laughs> from. So I'm unusual in publishing that I'm, I'm both a, an editor-in-chief and I'm a publisher, and I love aggregators. Um, aggregators bring traffic to my site. I don't I like aggregators that go and um, take the entire story. And if they do that, mm -hmm. um, then I ask them to cease and desist, and you can usually have it taken down. But aggregation is great. Aggregation exposes me to an audience that I would not otherwise be exposed to. And I like to think that if we do a good enough job uh, with our journalism, um, perhaps they'll um, be more likely to go and click through. One of their friends includes us in a Facebook or Twitter feed. And maybe they might even come to our site successively. So I regard every time that I'm aggregated as a, as a gift, you know, yeah. and as a sign that, um, as an opportunity to claim a, a new reader. No, I think that's a really important point. And that arguably, that is the new pipeline of the internet for content, right? It, that is the distribution channel. And that's part of why, you know, a small site like ours can grow 500% in one year without spending a single dollar on marketing. Because those people are, are marketing for us. You know, they are, you're creating content. And these pipelines have been built, you know, in a very, haphazard way, as is probably the case with any new thing. Uh, you know, so some distribution channels work better than others. But um, what I've been amazed by is how, broadly speaking, these channels work to connect audiences with content. Uh, with, you know, you don't have to do much more than set yourself up uh, and maybe create some RSS feeds, uh, you know, to sort of facilitate the habit, you know, to be a publisher uh, right now. So. That, that's the good news part of it. Like, yeah. can, can I just ask both of you a follow-up question, yeah, actually? Sure. Because <laughs> one, one, of the, one of the things that you write about, Jason, about um, possible ways of, say, quote, saving yeah. uh, news, yes, is having, having some content that is um, able to be aggregated. Yeah. And then once you get to the site, let's say, you know, you get to both of your sites, and then they love them, and, they, and then there's more that's available mm -hmm but for a price. Mm -hmm. And I mean, do you think that model has legs? I mean, is, or are you trying that out? Or are you are thinking trying. of trying it out? Or? We do it and it works. So, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so news has a declining value relative to time. Um, and it quickly becomes a commodity. And you can't, you can't really um, ask people to pay for it. Because whatever news event has occurred, no matter how smart it is, you can find it somewhere else. Um, but there is a form of journalism that people will pay for, and I think I know the, the criteria. So um, it has to be unique. Your mission genuinely has to be unique to yourself. And, and don't lie to yourself about that if you're a publisher. Yeah. It has to be uniquely smart. And again, don't, don't fib to yourself about it. Um, it has to help someone with a purchasing decision or some decision that is really core to their, their self-identity. And then weirdly, it has to be beautifully designed, which doesn't seem uh, self-evident. But if you can say those four things, you can charge for it. So The Economist does a fairly good job. 
uh, with um, charging for some of its content. The Economist Intelligence Unit has a billion dollar a year job uh, charging for its research. Uh, the bits of the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times that meet those criteria, they charge for. So I think you can charge for some um, content. The best example, of course, which re meets all my criteria is Consumer Reports, mm, uh, yes. which is a fantastically profitable business. Uh, maybe not the smartest, um, but it's very smart in its context. It tells you everything you, you need to know. Um, so bef before we take another question, we'll take you on. So aggregation is great. Um, as the real problem is advertising. So the real problem is the CPM, the cost per thousand uh, for every page impression you deliver for that aggregated content is bust. And that's a very complicated conversation What's wrong with advertising online. Um, and probably too deep to go into here now. But I want as much audience as I can possibly get. Well, yes, but in the in the but being that not all audience is created equal, and yeah, that's you know, true. I think that part of the problem has been that there's only been the grow your audience uh, model for uh, journalism, which is not necessarily suited to that, and so people are chasing after traffic, and you know, from mm. the vantage point of a small publication, you're going to lose that fight, and I'm not sure you know that you want that anyways, you know. Are you trying to serve a community, no matter how big that community might end up being, versus chasing? If everybody's chasing the big page views, that's where I think you can start to see a race to, you know, the bottom in terms of quality and content and all of that. And mm -hmm. I, I fear that that is one consequence of our overly limited conversation that we've been having so far about what this transformation and this adaptation to a new medium means for journalism, because in the end, that shouldn't be all that relevant. You know, I don't know that the goal of technology review should be to have like the biggest audience, although clearly we all have the potential now to be much bigger mm -hmm. in terms of audience size than in the past where it was so hard to have access to this information and, you know, cost a lot of money and, you know, you had to send it through the mail and, you know, it was hundreds of dollars a year for subscribing to these publications. So. Almost all publications should have bigger audiences potentially on the web since you can reach them so efficiently and for so low cost. That said, um, you know, do we really want to be chasing after, you know, the big audience? You know, do we need to be MSNBC or Yahoo News in order to be successful uh, in a new journalism world? So I'm going to resist the temptation to talk with the creation of a coherent, um, <laughs> qualified audience, which is important. And let's take another, another question, please. Thanks. Uh, my name is Rohit Sakuja. Uh, I work as a researcher here at the Industrial Performance Center. And, um, and I also host a radio show on the MIT station uh, called uh, Paradigm Shifts. Um, and my, my question is about the, I, just going back to this issue of, of given this transformation and given this sort of shift from, from kind of the old media um, world to the new media world. So one model is that so conventional wisdom is, OK, now information is basically free. Anyone can access it, um, death of the business model of, of journalism. Then there's what you, I, you were just talking about in terms of the subscription model. There's, there's two sets of content. There's a, there's a free version, and there's the, the premium version. And I wanted to ask about the value of, of given that that we do know the internet and the new media model, we do know a lot more about people. And, and there is this, this point that you were just making about all, not all audiences are created equal. There's the, there's, what, are there things out there and the things that, are, that, one's, one, that one could think of which are sort of akin to what Google did? That, that here as we go and we have an ability and, and there's a set of content, it, the content and the, that source attracts a whole group of people um, that, that is probably targeted in some way. And the fact that it's attracted by that medium mm -hmm. gives us a lot more information than we previously had um, about these customers. Does that inherently generate a new set of business models and a new way of, of that, 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 maybe, that, that maybe creates a whole new life and a whole new source of revenue for the industry? And, Sure. <laughs> Please. Well, <laughs> Have you, can you work on inventing it? So I, this is what I was referring to in terms of a coherent audience. So one of the reasons why you want to have a subscription business online mm -hmm. um, is because you can collect such uh, rich information. And the richest and most coherent audience of all is an um, engaged community. 
that's commenting and involved mm -hmm. in your in your site. So one of the things we spend a lot of time investing in a technology review um, is community, because I know everything about someone who is continuously commenting, contributing, actually maybe sometimes even writing blogs on our site. So the big metric that advertisers are beginning to move to at the moment isn't this cost per thousand, uh, which is you know, relatively worthless. So websites often offer less than two or three dollars you know, per thousand page impressions. Um, what you want to do though uh, is you want to go and have a cost per thousand of 50, 70 for your qualified audience. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's great to have a community. Because then you can start selling what are called um, cost per actions. And you can start selling lead gen um, and say, I have 100, 100 um, readers who have actually demonstrated that they are more interested in, oh, I don't know, in our, in our field, um, um, collaboration software than anyone else in the world. And we'll give you their names, and they've given us permission to use their names because they actually want to hear from you, Lotus, mm -hmm. Microsoft, Google. And that's when things begin to become a little bit more interesting. People actually only receive the advertising they want, which is a much more efficient model. Has anyone done that in journalism? Like, well, we're kind of doing it. So um, we do a little bit. Um, people are talking about that, no yeah. question. I, you know, I've talked with people who are interested in, in similar versions. You know, understanding and taking the insights of uh, Amazon, for example, mm -hmm. and applying those uh, to the behavior of consumers of, of news and information over time as that information begins to be acquired, you can see immediately that you can have a lot of smart uses of them. I mean, I'm hoping that, you know, this, this technology and this sort of good practices we're too small to be innovating like this on our own, but you know we have a blog, for example, that's written by Tom Ricks, who uh, you know is a Pulitzer Prize-winning military reporter, who uh, in in a year has really acquired a real following of uh, you know the people who are. Uh, running the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also the people who are fighting them. Uh, you know, who he really has this very interesting sort of elite audience of what I would call the military intelligentsia slash leadership. Um, you know, both at the Pentagon and probably internationally. You know, and it's a very, it's a community, although it includes captains, you know, at forward operating bases in Afghanistan, and a lot of, you know, generals with a lot of stars on their shoulders. My hope is that, you know, we'll move in that direction so that, um, you know, there's a lot of people who would, you know, once we figure out the right way to sell this and advertisers are set up to think like this, uh, you know, that's a unique audience. If you really want to reach, you know, 100 generals of above this rank, this is a good place to go. I haven't figured out how to, like, sell that yet, but um, that's obviously probably worth a lot more to those companies once they figure it out uh, than it is to be spending all this money and all these other websites that those generals are maybe not even looking at. So we actually do this, and if you want to talk about it afterwards, I'll, I'd love to chat with you about it. It can't exist independently, at least at the moment, of conventional banner advertising and conventional print and, other, and sponsorship advertising. But it's actually probably the fastest growing new kind of advertising we, we do. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm a graduate student here. Um, I, have a, I think a large part of the premise of this discussion is about the media changing and how the media is affecting what journalism is, rather than talking about the content that's being delivered per se. For example, for me, and this is where I'm coming from, the, the kind of journalism news notion died in the lead up to the Iraq war when all, I were get, all the news that I was getting from every source was he said, she said. You know, Bush said this, they said this, there's this or this. There was no context as to, you know, what the ramifications for something like this are. Are there weapons of mass destruction? You know, things like that. And I just lost trust in those kind of sources. So, you know, for me, I found that, you know, there's no way I can find this information myself. And the quote unquote honest broker is no longer there. So, you know, who do I look to for this kind of media? So, you know, I, I no longer subscribe to these magazines. I do pay for things like NPR, where they bring people on, experts ask questions, and let it be. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just, and I can, I can think about things in my own light without being told what to think. So I think at some level, you know, maybe it's more the, the product and, and the actual, is journalism reporting he said, she said? I mean, I, I open the New York Times and it's a list of things that happened yesterday. But it does, the context is missing in a large part. 
And there are some very good reporters. I'm not talking about them, but I really feel like it's the product that's that's causing the death and not the media change per se. You know, I, that's a very obviously it's a very powerful viewpoint. A, a lot of people share that sentiment, and I and I, I do believe that there has been a, a crisis of authority. Um, you know, there's clearly flawed reporting coming at this moment of, of technological innovation that you know has really significantly undermined. But I think it's a terrible shame because I think you're missing a lot uh, by not subscribing to the New York Times. And the the most the core thing that I'm most eager you know, that survives and, and is in the hands of, of students like you who, uh, you know, could really, you know, thinking of you as future citizens of the country, w what would it be like if you didn't have the New York Times uh, to show that you have uh, a governor who seems to be behaving in the most wildly inappropriate uh, right. way possible, you know, and influencing a witness. And, you know, that guy stays in place. Our politics is so much the poorer without those reporters working on that full time, not doing anything else. That is a loss leader. That costs a lot of money to do that. You know, you talk about flawed reporting on webs of mass destruction. You know, the New York Times, not this year, but the year before, won a Pulitzer for its reporting from Afghanistan and Pakistan at a time when almost no one else was doing this. How many billions of dollars have been spent without very much accountability in Pakistan over the last decade since 2001? You know, it's, it's, the, it's the intelligence reporters of the New York Times who have spent the time, you know, because they have access still, uh, because they represent an important segment of society, they have the ability to be interlocutors uh, with government officials in a way that citizen journalists do not and they're not going to. Uh, and as you said, you don't have the tools or the ability uh, or the time probably uh, to ask those questions yourself. You don't have uh, the luxury of someone paying you to spend your days doing that. Our society is immeasurably uh, weakened uh, if, if that doesn't exist. And I, I think that if you look at the New York Times today, you don't see a list of what happened yesterday. In fact, that's largely migrated online. And I think it's a, you know, it's a part of the trope of this sort of death of news conversation that has occurred that, that's unfortunate because it's something that people can believe in. But, but I, I don't think it's the case. Um, can I ask you a question? You, you, um, you know, you said, where, where do I look? Where do I find like a, it's like a badge, a stamp of approval? I mean, what would make you feel then that you're consuming something that, that is bona fide, that is that is trustworthy? Uh, better question. I mean, just less listing and, and questions to people who are experts, and and a lot of, you know, just not editorializing. But, but I, I feel like the context is important. But I, I feel that I'm led to, to just not to decide my own, you know, to, to take my own impression of the actual end. That there's a agenda-based reporting in a large scale. Not to say that everyone's like that, but I think, you know, more other people talking, but the people who actually matter, not the politicians, not this or that. The actual, like, if you're talking about healthcare, let's talk about healthcare. Let's not talk about other stuff. This is part, I mean, you're right, this is partly a consequence of the polarization of our culture. In, in order to maintain this impression of impartiality uh, and objectivity, m many American news organizations took on this view from nowhere, as it's sometimes mm. called. And the problem with the view from nowhere is if one of the two sides is divorced from reality, yeah, you, you no longer have an accurate view of what actually occurred. One of the reasons I like The Economist, a, a magazine I, I wrote for for many years, is that The Economist actually does represent both sides. So you can go and take your own view. And says, but one side is clearly nuts, right? <laughs> you know? And I, I, I admire that about The Economist. I think it's interesting. It's the, it's the publications that eschew the view from nowhere, which say, this is our point of view, and this is where we're coming from. Yes, this is what both sides say. And then take an opinion that are often the strongest ones. And I, I think, and interestingly, they're also very often, I think, um, written or conducted by people who are specialists in the field. Yeah. And therefore, somehow, I mean, and, and I think sometimes that's been also devalued. Um, and and, and I, I have to say what worries me a little bit now about, I mean, I was talking about this with some colleagues today about um, going out into the field and going, um, people going back to Mexico where they've been based and how are they going to make a living. 
the people who can make a living are people who don't have as much experience. I mean, they're people who are just straight out of college. That doesn't mean that you know you guys aren't smart, but you have less experience. And um, I think that uh, it, it's getting that balance right of having also people who have the experience to ask the tough questions, but tough questions which are then going to be formulated in such a way that you, as the consumer, you know, it's transparent. Basically, yes, they're they're specialists, but they're also being transparent and respectful of you, the reader, listener, viewer. Um, please. Yes. My name is Omer Sadat, and I'm a graduate student here. Uh, many of you spoke about the importance of mainstream papers like the New York Times or Washington Post for generating the baseline reporting that other blogs use, and I completely agree with that. But as you've noticed, have, have you? As you have no noted, uh, the funding models for such newspapers decaying. A couple of years ago, the, um, the head of the Yale's endowment fund, David Swenson, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times proposing that these main newspapers shift to a nonprofit model where they're endowed. And so could he comment on that? Like he said that, for example, to yeah. endow the New York Times, it cost $4 billion or $5 billion, which in a way is a small price to pay for a rigorous watchdog body. Yeah. Thank you. Well, not surprisingly, those uh, ideas have had a lot of appeal uh, inside <laughs> <laughs> news organizations as they've undergone some very painful um, shrinking over the last year, including the New York Times, which has shed a um, hundred newsroom jobs just over the last year. Um, and you know, although they've maintained more of that news gathering operation than than others, that's a significant cut. Um, you know, I'm. I'm not opposed to it entirely, but I'm also uh, still somewhat skeptical about whether that's, that's the right course, in part because I believe that the transformation that's required um, you know, is not merely one of business model, but um, of the content and the journalism itself as it comes to terms with uh, you know, the new uh, powers and capabilities of uh, the new tools at our disposal, and that uh, the content is still much more closely tied to this print product uh, then most people realize this is a big question of dispute, you know, of course, uh, in journalism right now. And I think that, um, you know, many newspaper journalists don't want to think that and they, they disagree. They don't think it's a content problem. They think it's a business model problem or some other kind of problem. Um, so that might influence, I think, the course of this debate over whether newspapers need to become nonprofit. In part, where you sit is where you stand on that question. And if you think there's a content problem, uh, you know, as, as, I, as I do, uh, then you probably think there's going to be a lot more transformation that's necessary, whether you're uh, uh, an unprofitable nonprofit or an unprofitable for-profit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I guess it's a bit of a red herring. Um, because unless the endowing foundations wouldn't take 100% of the costs, you still have to exist in a marketplace. Um, and um, if you, even if you have an endowing foundation, you're going to have to lose money at a sustainable, predictable rate. Um, so it still doesn't go and forgive us the necessity for finding both a content model that people want uh, and an advertising model that really supports some of the costs of, of publishing. So. Um, uh, MIT effectively endows technology review, some small portion of our operating costs, and I'm grateful for it. But in the end, we have to be a business that pays for itself and puts its profits back into the business. Well, I'm coming from the public service so <laughs> <laughs> perspective. I'm, I've got other, I mean, I'm, I, we, you know, the BBC has a whole lot of other worries around whether it's going to be uh, the, the politics around the license fee funding. So um, I, I don't really have anything to add. <laughs> this lady's waiting very patiently. <laughs> Hi, my name is Maria Karajanis, and I'm sorry this young gentleman left because he motivated me to stand up, and I was going to ask that question. So maybe I'll make a quick comment. Um, I was a journalist in 1971 and joined the Boston Globe, and we had typewriters. So I am speaking mm -hmm. from dinosaur land. And I did that for 15 years until I myself became utterly disenchanted with my profession. And so I would reiterate what he said, and I think it is a content problem. We've been talking a lot about journalism as an industry and advertising and how many eyeballs and everything. 
But there was a time, and I'm a living, breathing, and I can tell you from the distant past, um, it was a calling. And it was different, and it was a passion, and it was the most fun you could have doing something legal and getting paid. Um, hmm. We at the Boston Globe were the third paper to publish the Pentagon Papers. I remember being in the editor's office waiting to see if we were going to get arrested. And the next year, in 1970s, or a few years later, in 76, I went to work for the Rand Daily Mail in apartheid South Africa, and people literally were hauled off to jail. So journalism was different, and it was a passion. We were clueless that it was actually business. <laughs> we didn't know that. They didn't tell us. Um, and you know, all those advertising people were in a whole other part of the building, and nobody ever talked to them, and all those wonderful classified ads. But I do think journalists themselves ought to be asking themselves more questions instead of pointing fingers. I mean, I don't mean to make a speech, but I'm interested to hear what you say, because frankly, I think in some ways journalism and journalists have themselves to blame. Sure, the internet came along and a few other things, but at some point, infotainment and celebrity journalism and the lowest common denominator and even the New York Times, frankly, and the Boston Globe, for sure. They used to be more vigorous. They used to speak truth to power. It used to be different. Can, um, can I, can I yes. just uh, jump in? I mean, I think, um, I think, well, I mean, I actually started off by saying I felt journalism had to, journalists had to look at themselves as well. But I, I also think that you can't take um, the journalist, the, the structure of newspapers out of what you've just said. When you have newspapers that were being bought up by conglomerates, that you had um, shareholders who were putting uh, pressure on newspapers to make huge profits. Um, and then, of course, there was a time when there were, the profits were very easy. Suddenly, the prof profits become less easy. So what is the, 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 the people, you know, uh, people come in, management consultants probably come in and say, "Yes, let's cut here. Let's cut in the edit. Let's cut it on an editorial. Um, that means there there are fewer resources. Journalists are harder worked. I mean, I would, you know, I can't speak for all journalists, but I have to tell you, uh, m most of the journalists I know and work with still have a calling. They have a calling, and um, I, um, among my Neiman fellows, I have people." who um, have, I mean, they're, they're from outside the U.S. who have, one of them had her, her husband was killed um, because of his um, journalistic bravery. I, I know people in, in, inside the, you know, American journalists who have um, been in very dangerous situations because they wanted to report a story because they felt strongly about a story. Um, that doesn't mean we can't uh, be, we shouldn't be self-critical, because we should, we can't, I think this, you know, I think we all probably agree that this is, is like, um, we talk about, quote, golden age, but there's so many problems with this, quote, golden age. Yeah. And one of them was complacency, in a way. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. yeah, sure, absolutely. I love this uh, phrase that um, my friend and colleague Tom Stites came up with, which was, we had very big mouths and very small ears. <laughs> So, 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 yes, that's tr sure. that. There, there's that, but, but I, I also think that it could, the journalist calling continues to be strong in many, many people. Yeah. No, you know, these are just incredibly inspiring things. I mean, I, I, I think you're right, and I think that that crisis of journalism, it predates the internet. It's not, you know, a technology didn't didn't cause that. Um, you know, we may be seeing the effects of it, uh, and these are obviously a convergence of, you know, that with this moment in technology, but. You know, that's that's what I was trying to say in, in response to that guy is like let's let's figure out what's significant and important and really irreplaceable about what's the best of what the New York Times or other news organizations do today. Um, you know, when you work overseas uh, as a journalist and you see the, the incredible risks that people take uh, to produce uh, you know, independent, you know, accountability reporting, you know, you just can't be jaded about it, and it's not a business anymore. And, and, and frankly, what American reporters, even if a dwindling bunch have done, uh, you know, I was a very unintentional war correspondent, you know, almost by accident for the Washington Post. Um, you know, and I, I took that very seriously. I mean, you know, I, I really had no interest whatsoever in, uh, you know, covering the Battle of Tora Bora, you know, 
you're there for the Washington Post. What are you going to do except, you know, bear witness to, you know, in a way the U.S. has been an accidental participant, uh, you know, in these wars since 2001 anyways. And I think if you look at the, you know, sort of heroism of people who are doing that, they're not doing it for a business model or because, you know, Twitter might be a new way to reach consumers, you know. We have run out of time, and rather than summarize, since I see so many of you wish to go, I'm going to ask each one of the participants to say in two or three sentences or less um, what will be the, the future of news that will return it to its, its calling and its healthy, healthy economic underpinning. Well, uh, very quickly. I mean, I think there's no getting around the fact that a number of people are going to be negatively affected and there's going to be a lot of heartache. Um, I do think, though, that there is, that we're at the beginning of huge change that may bring new models that will transform the way we report um, both about our communities and about the world. And one word we haven't used, which I'll just throw out there, is um, collaboration. We've talked about collaborating with audiences, but I also think collaborating between journalists mm -hmm. is um, something that will be become um, more frequent, I hope, and I think really hugely, hugely beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we're going we're gonna to follow your business model, which you're busy uh, uh, inventing. But, um, you know, I, I agree with, with all of that. I think that there is a future. Uh, it may well include a substantially smaller number of uh, U.S. journalists or, yeah. or their jobs will be so different, uh, you know, they will certainly no longer be engaged in as much duplicative uh, journalism as they have been uh, in the past. Um, my hope is that uh, new kinds of uh, journalism and content emerge from this, uh, that uh, we remarry expertise uh, and journalism in a way, uh, you know, that arguably they had become divorced from each other over time. So I think there's reason to be optimistic on the content side, as, as our other questioner talked about. Technological advances are very likely uh, to create new models, both of our content and also hopefully of our, our business. So um, I guess we'll just have to hang on. <laughs> well, it is going to be a fantastically unpleasant time in the news. Many, many newspapers and magazines that exist now will not exist in five years. Most journalists, I fear, who are journalists now will not be journalists in five years. But perhaps at the end of it, we'll, we will be returned to our calling, returned to our community, and we'll do a better job in pleasing all of you. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you uh, to Susan and thank you to Maria.